Hello folks and welcome back to uh, the Mushix uh, mainframe channel. Um, I had promised to be sending, uh, be, I'll be sending some more videos uh, uh, throughout September in my last video. And uh, here I am again. Um, uh, some of the comments and requests and emails I've been receiving uh, in the last uh, couple of months have been about uh, showing how to program in COBOL, which I know almost nothing about, uh, or Assembler, or other languages. And um, and I've, I think I've mentioned before, I only really know a couple of languages well. Um, one, and, and of course, you know, when I say well, is for my own needs, uh, there's always uh, artists in every in every uh, profession and in every science and in every uh, in every skill, uh, I, I'm certainly not a virtuoso when it comes to programming. I can hold my own, but uh, there's there's always masters, and I, I wouldn't define myself as a master in any by any stretch of the imagination. But I can get by with what I need to do, uh, and I have a lot of fun doing it. And um, and when you talk about mainframe, the the mainframe environment is really meant to be used as a development platform just like Linux I mean when if you if you use Linux then it's because you're going to do some development sooner or later uh, Windows is not as much a development platform of course it can be uh, but as as we all know there is so much uh, ready-made software for Windows that it's almost unimaginable to have a particular need and not find uh, either freeware or shareware or commercial software that fulfills the need on the Windows platform Linux is much more of do what you have to do or do what you need make build your own uh, solution and um, and of course Linux is also a fantastic development environment because you have this interplay on Linux of of the compiler and the operating system and the uh, development tools uh, that all kind of plays so nicely together um, if you have a Linux machine in front of you it's kind of natural that you will want to start to do some development and and most people get into it because they want to automate some scripts maybe with some bash or shell scripts and then later on maybe start to do some more work on uh, on interpreter languages like uh, python or php and then eventually i think almost everybody will move into c um, or c plus plus and uh, some of the newer languages such as uh, golang uh, the go language which i have kind of taken a like a liking to uh, in recent uh, in the recent year so anyway but um, what I read uh, and, and by the way and the same is on the mainframe I mean the mainframe is just really a development environment uh, very few people buy a mainframe and then run a packaged software on it most people most environments and most most shops run a mainframe because they have developers and they develop their own software and then if you put the scale um, capability of the mainframe then you have a natural environment for developing enterprise applications. And, uh, and that's how I started my programming uh, 30, 35 years ago. And uh, today we're going to look a little bit into PL1, which is my, one of my favorite languages. PL1 is, a, is an old language. IBM created it in the 60s because they wanted to replace Algol with a new, more powerful language. And, um, and when they uh, they created the committee, which is always the worst thing to do when you want to create something new. You never, never start with a committee first because you're almost certain to kill it. But anyway, that's what IBM did, and that's what corporations did back then, and I guess they still do it today. Um, but they uh, created a committee and then created a new programming language called PL1, Programming Language 1. It was due to be called new P NPL, new programming language, new programming language, but then they changed it to PL1. And IBM still offers excellent compilers for it. I would argue that the best compilers IBM has ever produced are probably the PL1 compilers, especially the optimizing compiler of the 80s. It was an amazing compiler, and I still miss it. And I wish that IBM would eventually release it into um, the community for us to use it and write more great software. It's a 31-bit compiler, obviously. Um, whereas here on, t on our beloved TK4, we only have um, a 24-bit compiler from the 60s called the PL1F compiler. Why F? Well, because IBM had uh, several uh, versions of the compiler. They had 
a compiler that would, six, that would require 64 kilobytes, and therefore F, and they had compilers for DOS VS, um, or DOS, uh, well, it was already called DOS VS by then, that would require only 16 kilobytes. Uh, but the more powerful compiler is the IBM PL1 compiler. Now, that is this, the compiler itself is a very complex uh, piece of software. It has uh, way over 100 passes, or close to 100 passes, I think, um, to, to correct myself, close to 100 passes. So it goes over the source code 100 times while it compiles it to first uh, uh, check the syntax and obviously then compile it more and more and even optimize it where it can and, uh, and they eventually will create a... Uh, a uh, load module um, after after you link edit it and and uh, it, it, it's just an outstanding compiler I like it very much and I do a lot of programming in it uh, let's look a little bit at the structure of uh, PL1 compiler uh, of, of the PL1 language now anytime I have to um, I have to write something in a new um, in a new language what I like to do is write the uh, solution for the uh, a solution finder for the and Queen's problem. Uh, you may know the problem. It, you have a chessboard of n times n size, uh, so let's say 8 by 8, um, I, and then uh, you have to put um, 8 queens um, on the chessboard and find all positions for those 8 queens so that the queens cannot uh, beat each other. So, um, and, and it's a classic uh, recursive or backtracking uh, problem um, and uh, and and if you have a solution solver a solution finder for the n queens problem you're going to understand a little bit more about the uh, very important uh, uh, components of any programming language such as recursion such as uh, blocks such as do loops while loops and uh, ranges of uh, of uh, for loops etc you will get to understand a little bit about those very important components which are different from language to language one more thing to understand is um, let me go back here um, let me just create uh, her 2 test cntl pl1 history so um, the predecessor of pl1 is algol uh, very clearly. Uh, Algol was a highly influential language in the 60s because it introduced such new concepts such as uh, that they were before unknown such as uh, structured language, structure programming, um, such as uh, um, uh, scopes of variables and other things and um, and Algol is still a very stimulating language so I, you know if you want to spend and you have a long flight uh, find yourself an excellent book on Algol. There's some uh, on Amazon for a couple of dollars, and uh, read those during a long flight, uh, because uh, you understand that a lot of the things that we do today actually originated uh, 50 plus years ago with Algol. So Algol uh, begat um, PL1. Okay, uh, so PL1 clearly took uh, elements from uh, Algol and tried to. Um, to keep the good stuff of algo such as word tonality and and other uh, of the language um, but that also improved the readability and uh, the understanding of scope of variables etc uh, but also make it a system programming language which algo is not so you have bitwise operators um, and other interesting structures which were at later on also uh, added to algo I think 68 um, then uh, PL1 was still is very uh, belo beloved programming languages and still used in many many um, environments today but then clearly um, um, the new programming language impetus or, or development and research moved from the mainframe to mini computers uh, in the 70s and with mini computers you obviously have the PDP series and on the PDP I think uh, 10 um, uh, Richie and uh, what's the uh, Dennis Richie and Kernigan uh, developed an, a language called BCPL which I don't remember at the top of my mind right now what it stands for and I was like programming language basic I don't know BCPL um, 
And BCPL uh, was good, but it lacked many important things. And out of BCPL came a programming language called B. And I think you know uh, where this is going. And um, and I think a big part of Unix was written in B language. And then uh, they understood that they lacked certain structures in, in the B language, so they developed the C language, uh, and they rewrote Unix in C. Okay, um, so they rewrote the Unix kernel in C itself, and um, and then obviously from C plus plus from C, then you go to C plus plus, and and obviously that had an influence on mo almost everything else, such as uh, Go language, which I like a lot, uh, Google's language, um, and and. And of course, a long, long list here of other languages. So um, you can see, and even today, when I program in Go language, I very often recognize elements from PL1, which I also did a lot of programming in many dozens of or hundreds of thousands of lines of PL1 that I wrote over the last 50 years, and I still recognize some elements here in Go Lang. Um, so uh, this is kind of the um, this is how this all happened. Um, and uh, and, um, and and so it's important to understand where PL1 came from. Um, so as I said before, uh, when I start a new programming, uh, when I start to learn a new programming language, I first try to find to write the solver for the uh, N uh, Queens problem, and here I have one. Uh, so we do highlight for uh, PL1. Um, I wonder why we don't get proper syntax highlighting uh, here. It may have to do with the size of my um, terminal here. All right. Please forgive me, but um, I may have to log out and log in again because this could be a TSO uh, thing. Let me just quickly log out. Log on her zero two. Uh, standard TK four password. Oops. Okay, so we don't want the history. We want this highlight PL one highlight JCL. Oh, this is very weird. I don't know why the syntax highlighting is not working. I will have to write to Greg Price. Um, the uh, author of uh, RevEdit, uh, this amazing editor here, uh, but uh, this seems to be something. Uh, well, um, I don't know what's wrong with the syntax highlighting, but let's look at this. So we have here a simple job um, which writes to uh, class H, held output, and I run it with a maximum of 30 minutes to avoid loops, or we can even make it uh, three minutes to avoid loops altogether. Um, and I ask it to optimize it as much as possible. Um, this is you know, the PL1F compiler, as I mentioned. Uh, is an optimizer compiler, of course, nowhere near the optimizing capability of the IBM opt 31 bit optimizer compiler. This is obviously only a 24 bit compiler. And as was um, um, usual in the 60s, it only understands uppercase. Um, I think the optimizer compiler uh, later on uh, still only took uppercase, but uh, modern PL1 compilers from IBM also take any case. Um, um, and so uh, we have a procedure here, compile and go, and um, so the loader will do the linkage here. We don't invoke a linkage editor step on its own, and here is my uh, solver. So um, so this is PL1. You s always start with the proc options main, which you probably recognize from C, um, and um, DCL means declare. Now one of the things about um, PL1 is that its form it's free form. I could write any one of these words here, uh, keywords, on a separate line, or I could um, um, I could 
I could just uh, introduce a space here, let's say like this. Uh, uh, this will be valid syntax here in PL1. Uh, in uh, external here means static, like in C static, so that it's uh, it uh, the 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 space the the space is created at the invocation of the uh, of the load module, and uh, uh, so there is of course there is nothing like uh, there's no need for uh, garbage collection or anything like that in PL1. Uh, but by the way, whenever you run a PL1 program, there's also um, there's also a whole library that goes with it, which uh, lets you recover the interrupt handling, such as divide by zero and other conditions. So you can create uh, on conditions statements, um, and then there's a what we would call a thread today or a task in MVS that runs with the PL1 program that uh, catches the, those conditions. So it is it, there is more than just the load module running when you run a PL1 compiled program, but uh, this is a little bit beyond the scope of today's. Uh, video, uh, but these two variables here, this is uh, an array of 35 um, units. Now, um, uh, PL1 um, is is independent. You you can declare either you know it goes from zero to 35 or from one to 35. Uh, in this case here, it's uh, 36 units actually. Um, which, by the way, I think the uh, Queen's problem has only been solved today up to 24, not beyond 24. So. 35, which is a very small array, even for those days, uh, is is beyond the calculation capability of today for uh, chessboard sizes beyond uh, 24, even with supercomputers. And then we have a counter here. Um, obviously, you always want to avoid static as much as possible. I just made my job easy here uh, for you guys to show. You don't need to initialize uh, counters in PL1. They should be initialized to zero, but just to make sure. Um, you need to uh, sysin file. Uh, we need to refer to a file called to an uh, sysin, and here in my program, the sysn is uh, just a card with uh, the size of the chessboard here, as you can see down here. Um, and uh, and then you need to declare built-in um, operators such as absolute. Um, and uh, one thing that bothers me in Go language, by the way, completely outside uh, PL1 for a moment, if I may digress, uh, is that Go language doesn't have an absolute operator. Um, I mean, how can you create a modern language without an absolute operator? I mean, it's not difficult. You can just use an if. If this is, uh, you know, it's positive, then uh, then let it be. If it's negative, multiply it times minus one. But still, I mean, you know. I, I don't understand what Google was thinking. And then you want to declare the sysprint, which is the the, the, the the data definition needs to match it. And here it is. Um, we have here a beautiful um, printing line. Um, and then um, we have uh, the counter here, the internal counter. Uh, then we get the here with the get list, we get uh, the sys in record, and and then we just write something on the batch output here, saying that we're beginning processing. If it's less than four, then there's no solutions for chessboards less than four, so let's not even get in there. If it's more than 23, um, then n is probably too high, especially if it's in an emulator mainframe such as the one we have here on the left. Um, and uh, and then um, we call queens. Um, so in in PL one, you have to say either x equals queen one. That would be a, a, a legal uh, statement. But in the absence of that, um, you have to just if you don't assign the result from a function, you just have to call it with call. Um, and then when we return from queen, we know processing has finished. Um, and then let's go to queen. Here's a procedure. It receives an argument. Um, procedure n, because we call here call with n, n being the chessboard size. And um, we do refer back to the. Oops. Uh, we do refer back to the 
uh, array, the static array, and the static counter. But then we declare also the variable that we use in here. You must declare it again, uh, just like in C. And um, and here comes the big part of the processing. If you should look up on uh, on Wiki how to do backtracking for the uh, the Queen's solution finder. I'm not going to get into it here from a mathematical point of view, but I will describe um, a little bit um, how this all works uh, in, in PL1 with uh, loops. So a, a while loop in PL1 is called a do while. Do while k is above ze is, is bigger than zero, and then we have the array. Um, uh, that we mentioned before, the static array which we use, and then we increase that. And since the chessboard is two-dimensional, uh, we proceed here with um, with uh, moving queens up. And that's a classic backtracking problem if you have a chessboard of eight times eight. What you do is you put one on the first uh, uh, column, and then you go up, and then you put up uh, one on the second column, and you start to move up the second queen. And as long as they don't hit each other, um, then uh, you're fine. If they hit each other, you need to move. You need to move the first one back down again, and uh, unt until they don't, they're not um, um, threatening each other. So, um, and then here, um, while we move those queens around, we, um, we keep checking in place, which is the function just before. Um, same size to avoid any problems, but the PL1 catches those anyway. So we go uh, from uh, I, uh, which is the positioner for the queen, um, and here we try to find out if, they're, if they are threatening each other in this loop here, um, uh, either on the same line or diagonally, because of course queens can threaten each other diagonally as well, and this absolute here eliminates the um, the diagonality of the position of those queens and um, one thing to understand here is uh, here very important if I was to eliminate here this minus one I would create an endless loop because I would never get um, I, I would always go one above the chessboard size so <laughs> very important here to understand this you know the range of uh, while loops um, so you, uh, this this simple mistake here, if I was just writing it like this, I would just create an endless loop. Um, and we can play with it maybe. I will, uh, I'll make th this, uh, by the way, this member here, this source code is on my uh, GitHub, on my mainframe, uh, MBS uh, Utilities GitHub, so um, you can play with it there. Uh, I'll have a link below this video. And um, so here we place, we check if they're placed well, and then we continue here in uh, in uh, this uh, do while loop and here is where most uh, here is where most of the calculation is done if you had like iron memory uh, core memory this is where the memory would get hottest because this those cells that get exercised the most um, now I'll tell you also one big limitation of uh, of uh, PL1 there's there's just an end statement and that's kind of like the parentheses the breaks the curl breaks in uh, in C. You need to be very very sure. Like we we have here four levels at the deepest. We have four levels of do. Do is like open curl bracket close uh, uh, curl bracket. And the deeper you are, uh, the deeper the more you have to be careful which which um, uh, bracket you're closing with an end statement. That's why here I have comes like of the inside else, okay? So this is this do, and of course this relates to the um, to of the first if, okay? This closes this if. So the formatting, since in PL1 you have free format, you need to make sure that you really um, align those very properly, because when you have like in this case, let's look how many ends we have: one, two three, four ends. And you can literally go crazy here trying to find out which uh, which do you're closing, okay, in PL1. And so you need to, and this is, that's why I have sometimes when I put an end usually during the programming, I also put in a comment of which do um, 
I'm closing. And by the way, you can also put uh, um, labels on each statement. I could write here, you know, uh, Moshex. Uh, this will be legal syntax, and then you can actually then uh, re refer in your in your uh, comments to which label you're closing. That can, that could help. But we will see also the compiler itself will give you uh, nesting uh, statements. So let's see if I have nesting enabled here. Um, no, I do I don't. Uh, nest list. Okay. Uh, this will give us uh, the nesting of the statements, and list will give us the assembler output um, for the PL1 source code. Um, so after we've uh, researched all options, and, um, if we found an option, if we found a, fa a valid uh, solution where there's a position of eight queens that don't threaten each other, then we just increase the count. At this place, at this this area, we could just do something like this: call print um, who we'll do your k. And so then um, we could have a function which would actually print the solution very, very easily. Um, just uh, have to have a loop uh, that prints the size of the chessboard. Obviously, if you go for very large chessboards, you will always spill over into the next line and print the output because we, don't, we only have up to 133 for a IBM 1403 printer. Um, but this is how we would do it. Um, uh, and maybe we'll also, you know, count so we could have solution number so and so um, and if it's not a solution uh, let's put in here just to it's funny that the syntax highlighting is not really working that well I think it's my terminal size which is throwing off the edit here I'll, I'll contact the developer and and if you don't find one here's the backtracking then you go back down again so um, then in the end, uh, we just close everything. Um, refer to the top label here and queens, which I think you have up to six. One, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have up to seven characters here for the labels, um, and um, and that's about it. That's really all there is to it. So uh, why don't we just execute this job and pay attention to the CPU here? Uh, you'll see that um, CPU. Uh, it's going to go up quite a bit, and this is, by the way, an old IBM Dell, uh, not an IBM, a Dell XPS 13 laptop with a, I think an i an Intel i5 um, from around 2014 or 15. But um, we'll do some benchmarking very soon. So let's execute this. You see here, 112 MIPS, 123 MIPS. This would be beyond any mainframe, even from the early 2000s. I mean, this is. Uh, run, running on 120 MIPS um, would have cost uh, early 2000s probably something like 20, 30 million just for the CPU alone, um, or maybe 15 million dollars for the CPU alone. And here I'm running it on my laptop. Um, and so um, the fact that it's running shows us. Oh, did I just did I put in the endless loop place? No, uh, okay, so we didn't, So this will complete, this job will complete. If it doesn't run into the limit of three minutes, which we gave it, uh, we're running with a chessboard size of 13, as you see here. Um, so this should complete soon. Um, let's go and look at the output, which should come up soon. I have previously checked. Um, so we can also see here the running job, by the way. Um, we we see here it finished with a return code of four, so there's a warning in the in the PL1 source code, but that's minor. But obviously, for production, we would have to go and see exactly what it is that threw off. Um, and while it's still calculating here, uh, uh, let's see here. This is the the OS 360 PL1 compiler app. It's funny to see. In 2017, in September 2017, still see OS 360 being printed out. Um, it took our uh, our our parameters, so load, no deck, 
optimizing two nested uh, shows the nesting of the statement and produce a nest under output um, um, so let's see here and here by the way you have the nesting you see um, this is the nesting that it gives us uh, deep down the nesting and this is three down plus the original so it's four as I mentioned before this is where we have most of the calculation okay so the job finished as you can see here and um, this is the storage requirements we obviously have static the uh, external reference that I mentioned before um, and here is the uh, program at uh, the, uh, the assembler um, you could actually this is called pseudo assembly because IBM didn't actually mean for us to to be able to copy those statements and then uh, create an assembler program out of it um, and obviously refers a lot to um, libraries but you could almost uh, program it this way I mean you can follow exactly what each statement does and it's very useful in debugging and um, so here's the loader so we don't do a linkage editor step here because it's such a simple program we have no external references but um, the loader itself can obviously link it uh, as well and um, let's go look at the final result oh I just killed it I'm so sorry guys <laughs> uh, let me just run it again with 10 so we can see that one full output um, and uh, and then I run again with 13 so we can do some benchmarks um, let's run it yet again I just want to go show you guys um, the finished output so um, this will be the, the compile uh, and loading return with four just a minor warning and then um, the the execution sorry the compile and then the loader here uh, executed the, the job without any re uh, negative return code um, and um, you can see here how the output looks like um, so for a solution um, for a size of 11 times 11 chessboard it found uh, how many solutions? Uh, 2680 solutions um, and uh, in the meantime I'm recalculating again because I just purged the j previous job I'm very sorry about this but I'm recalculating it again obviously me just uh, using the enter key here and uh, F7 and F up will slow down the execution of my solution finder quite a bit oh did you see that uh, I just had 250 MIPS uh, max rates type max rates here you can see that uh, wow I was running at 282 MIPS in the tightest loop I was executing there and I was doing 10,000 IOs per second at the at the peak that's quite a mainframe um, so it's still running here and by the way um, we can also use our monitor here um, uh, if you go to 3 mon you can actually see here very nicely uh, the job executing and running at 100% CPU so it's taking CPU from almost everything else um, you can see that the CPU is pegged at 100% and um, so we have the monitor here showing us what's going on um, and it's all TCB task control block SRB is when the operating system is executing a request such as an interrupt or something or a request for IO for the address base TCB is when the address base itself is executing um, so that's it uh, job finished and uh, let's go look at the uh, execution time okay so this should be if I go to the bottom yeah so for 13 for a chessboard of 13 times 13 there's 73,000 uh, something solutions and if you go to the top we'll see how long it took um, so it started at 9:20 a.m. 31 seconds and it finished at 9:22. So it took two minutes and uh, 14 seconds. Okay, so let's make a mental note of that. 
for a, set, a chessboard size of 13, the execution time inside the mainframe will be 2 minutes and 14 seconds. And I mention that because I have I wrote the exact same code. Um, uh, I also have in Go language. could actually, um, yeah, I can, I think, um, let's just look for it online, if you go to my repository here, uh, github, um, oops, sorry guys, um, I'll just do this very quickly. Um, So I have the exact same code, uh, and you will be able to see, if you compare this to the PL1, you see it's the exact same code, uh -huh. even the function names are the same. Okay, so uh, let's compare this to the code itself, um, I'll put them next to each other, I hope this all looks, you can all follow here guys, uh, folks, um, no, let's be gender neutral. Uh, so, <laughs> I have the ac absolutely same code here, so I start, um, and if it's less than 4, as I mentioned before, then there's no, there's no need to actually calculate. If it's uh, bigger than 23, then there's no point either, and then we call queen. See, I do a call, do call. I do a call queen here, and I have a queen n here. Even the variables are exactly the same. And uh, and then I go into queen, and remember what I mentioned about the end matching. Obviously, you know this kind of thing here, where the editor vim here, my uh, vi improved, obviously automatically highlights the open curl uh, that it matches. No such thing in on the mainframe unfortunately, but everything else looks exactly the same. If you look at this, um, I mean, it does look almost exactly the same. And this shows you also that C, uh, the, you know, that Go language came from C and C came from B and B came from BCPL and BCPL <laughs> came from PL1. Uh, you can see 50 years of programming language history here right now on your screens uh, if you look at this. It's exactly the same. Nothing really changed in changed in 50 years. Um, so uh, I mention all this is because we remember that this PL1 inside the emulated mainframe um, took two minutes and 14 seconds of real wall clock time. Okay. Um, now let's just run uh, wins go and let's do a 13 size. Okay. So for a size. Uh, my solution solver here in Go language, which is not quite as fast as C, but almost, just you know, just within single-digit percentage of C execution time, and um, is one second and 28, uh, 1.28 seconds. Okay, this is seconds. Um, and here it took two minutes and 14. Now, why do I mention that? Because um, two minutes and 14 seconds 
that's 134. So, um, so we're about 100, just, well, you know, 134 times, uh, just about 104 times uh, slower on the emulator than it is on a real CPU. Uh, and this obviously is with the same CPU, with the same Intel i5. So why am I mentioning that? Because I've been mentioning throughout my videos over the last uh, year or so that the emulator here, the Hercules emulator, um, is about, um, oh sorry, I'm clicking all over the place, sorry folks, uh, is about for every mainframe instruction, uh, S37 instruction, it needs about 100 Intel instructions to emulate that, that uh, Hercules instruction. And this is in a very tight loop, obviously. When you do I.O., things get even slower. But um, I've been mentioning that it's about 1 to 100. And this seems confirmed here. Uh, it's 104. Okay. Uh, I can also run uh, the same solution finder uh, in C with a s size of 13, 13 times 13. And it took just about under one second. And I know that if I do time... Um, it's system, well, this is, um, actually it's quite a bit faster than my Go language solver, but it must be algorithmic. I didn't spend a lot of time optimizing the algorithm, but um, we cannot take this C solution solver because I don't remember the algorithm I used there. Um, uh, I may have done a lot of improvement the algorithm, but we need to, to use the Golang uh, because it is the ab absolutely same algorithm as this one. And this gives us the real, you need to obviously compare algorithms um, when you compare um, execution time or, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So uh, this is the absolutely same code, in, you know, as, you, as we show, so before, this is the same path. Um, and it's 104 times slower on the mainframe on Hercules than it is on um, on the real uh, Intel hardware, and that's an indication that it takes about um, about uh, 100 times more uh, Intel instructions to execute one single uh, S370 instruction that we have here, um, and the rest is just. Uh, the output from the uh, compile go, uh, step uh, from the yeah from the from the from the execution of the job which includes compile and then loading of the um, of the module and they linking uh, doing some light linking and executing it. So um, this is it. Um, it. This is just a very light introduction into PL1. Um, I will do um, hopefully something similar for Algo because it's a programming language I like a lot. It explains a lot about programming languages we use today so I'll be releasing a video about that later on. Um, I may also maybe invite a guest who is very strong on COBOL to do one for COBOL for us. Um, other than that, uh, this is it for today. Um, wish you all uh, a great weekend ahead. Um, and uh, today is September 15th, uh, so we're in the middle of the month already. And, uh, and uh, see you all soon. Please do subscribe to my channel if you like my videos, uh, so you get notifications of future videos. And press on the like button if you like this particular video. Thank you all for listening and watching, and uh, be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.